Welcome to the Public House Podcast. Now serving behavioral science and police academy training. I'm Dr. John O'Neill. And I'm Dr. Don O'Neill. In this episode, we speak with Scott Willitson, who has over 20 years of experience in law enforcement. And I answer some questions that he has uh, related to providing feedback within the context of police academy training. And we discuss some of the limitations of applying behavioral science within that context. I hope you enjoy this discussion, and if you have any questions about how behavioral science might apply to your police academy training, please feel free to reach out through our website or directly at research at cbsinstitute.org. Enjoy. Why don't we start with you telling us uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, whatever you want to divulge, and um, tell us a little bit about your experience and how you got to where you are. Sure. So I have been in law enforcement now since full time for over 22 years. Um, a little bit of time here. I was a cadet briefly and uh, for a year and a half, two years when I was in high school and I was reserved for about a year first. But full time, I've been in law enforcement since, um, oh my God, it's been so long. I can't remember the year I started. <laughs> what year was that? Check the certificates. I'm literally looking <laughs> At my board, like, when did I start full time? I started in '98, full time in summer of '98. So, uh, hey, I graduated high years. school uh, the year later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I worked both uh, corrections and patrol. I was on the SWAT team. I did court security. So I have a, uh, and I worked in a very rural county. So we were um, very small population. The main city only had a population of. Uh, about 12,000 people. Um, I've been in charge of the use of force program. So what that means, uh, use of force classroom structure and making sure everything's up to date, current with the laws, which just changed to get state where I'm at. And uh, we also absorb into that our use of force scenario training, um, our force on force training. And uh, the reason for that is because obviously, you know, there's a direct relation between teaching them in the classroom what they can do versus then actually having them do it. Um, I'm a firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor. At one time, I was a less lethal instructor. Uh, All those certifications have lapsed. Uh, But uh, I still still do some shooting here and there, just qualified this morning. And uh, I don't really teach a ton of DTs anymore, but I still do a little bit here and there. And uh, yeah, so... uh, Really, the reason I was hoping we could talk is because I have a lot of specific questions based on your podcasts that you and Don were doing, feedback and things like that. And uh, I was hoping to get a little more insights from you guys because, you know, we're, we're always looking to improve and we we uh, try to run as best we can an evidence-based program. You guys have said, you know, the evidence is spotty and uh, sometimes hard to find. And, or, mm-hmm. or my now, my new problem is... Um, constantly being bombarded with new um, research to the point where <laughs> I have a really hard time kind of keeping up with all the reading now. that's I went from like I couldn't find any research to like people are now just like research. And, uh, and so I was hoping we could, yeah, we could talk for a bit and, and see if we can't, you know, come up with some things. And maybe I was hoping for you guys that uh, I might be able to give you some practical aspects that maybe doesn't pop up in the research. So, have you have you been um, receiving a lot of a lot more attention, or um, academics reaching out a lot more frequently since uh, since the pandemic and the recent events in the media? Well, so not since the pandemic, but we've been working really closely with some researchers out of Washington State University. Um, the James is right. Been, uh, Yep, the Jameses. And yeah. so um, I've gotten to know them really well, uh, really like a lot of their research. And, uh, you know, so we've looked at like their metrics around things like social interaction, uh, deadly force decision making, uh, critical incident. And we're trying to integrate a lot of those metrics into our decision making training um, here and, and what we're trying to get the students to do uh, and what kind of behaviors that we you know that based on the metrics seem to lead to more successful outcomes. And then of course we're discouraging the ones that lead to less successful outcomes. And uh, so we've been doing quite a bit of work with them and uh, I, I get to talk to them, at least even 
monthly, if not every couple of weeks. And they're not, uh, they're not too far away from you either, right? I mean, no, we're actually relatively close. In fact, I, they, uh, Stephen comes down once a month to where I'm working and runs my basic students through um, a very short assessment. And it's not because he's developing research on that. It's because he's trying to help us evaluate, like, we've made a lot of adjustments in the way we deliver training and what we're delivering training and the order in which we're delivering training. And mm-hmm. we're trying to figure out, have those adjustments that we've made, uh, are those showing up in the performance of the students that we are instruct? And so he's been coming down except the pandemic, which has really kind of interfered because every time there's a state like lockdown or anything like that, then he can't come down. Um, but we've continued training except for a brief period of lockdown because, um, you know, we still need police. We still need corrections officers. We can't just say, hey, there's a, there's a pandemic. No police are getting trained for a while. Except so for while Portland, we've... right? Portland's not uh, using the police anymore. Uh, no, Port- Portland's still <laughs> using the police quite a bit. And uh, as, is, as is Seattle and, and the other cities in the area. But uh, – <clears throat> As far as the research goes, or not really research, I should correct that because Stephen will jump all over me and say, it's not research. I'm evaluating your training program. Uh, And so getting those evaluations regularly with every graduating class on a monthly basis has been really hit and miss just Mm -hmm. based on travel restrictions and pandemic restrictions and things like that. But um, I mean, that's great that you, yeah, you have them uh, regularly um, having a look at what you're doing and, and obviously I'm sure you give them a shout and just ask questions or, or try to get, uh, some feedback on what you're doing. So it's nice to have somebody like that, that's uh, readily accessible and, and that you can bounce ideas off of as well. Yeah. Uh, they're a great resource. Um, and we, yeah, whenever there's a study I've read or something that I've heard about, either I can bounce it off them and, like you said, or ask them questions about it. And that's fantastic. On top, one of our other um, staff members here is actually in the process of getting their doctorate. So they're, and and they're really involved in the evidence-based world. And so they're constantly feeding me like, hey, here's a new study you should look at, things like that. I'm looking at Paul stuff. And of course we um, have been using and talking about your research with Dawn on things like unintended discharges and academy training and things like that Mm -hmm. uh we've been looking at those for years and and we talk about those and we've made small some you know we were already doing a lot of it but we've made some small investments to our training programs based on your research too so uh it's really nice to be be able to have these questions with uh researchers such as yourself and dawn and stephen james you were saying you have some specific questions, and I, I saw your email with a few of them in there. Is there uh, is there one that you want to start with? Um, well, yes, I was um, really intrigued by. It was like your, I want to say your second podcast, and you and Dawn were discussing feedback, mm-hmm. and I know you've done some research where you looked at academy training across the country, and you noticed some things about feedback, and some of my specific questions were. Um, how does the feedback that you envision, because I liked a lot of the things you said, how does the feedback that you are talking about differ when you look at something like offensive tactics training or firearms training versus, hey, that was a really good uh, armbar takedown. And so um, I'm just curious as to what you see the things that instructors can do either during training or, you know, during those breaks or, or actual periods of specific structured feedback? What are the things that you think are more successful that we should try to get instructors to avoid? And I think, you know, a lot of the structures, mm-hmm. instructors across the country would really benefit from that because it's one thing to say, you know, we, we should do good feedback, but a lot of them don't quite understand what that looks like or what it doesn't look like. Yeah, and I think the the default for a lot of instructors, at least uh, the ones that we've observed, is to focus more heavily on the negative aspects or what the what the cadets are doing wrong. 
Right. Um, so there's there's that piece and encouraging the instructors to focus on the positive and oh you did these pieces you did X Y and Z correctly and then go into but this piece is where you you made a mistake um, and then the detail of the the feedback as well um, so as you just said um, something along the lines of uh, you didn't do this takedown correctly but expanding on that and and talking about the discrete steps that were not done correctly and and maybe there is something in there that you because from our our point of view we're looking to reinforce what they're doing correctly and building upon that all the time as opposed to focusing on the things that they're doing wrong so so it's a matter of reinforcing and uh, solidifying what's being done correctly already and then building upon that and we, we call that shaping um, but what we observed was a heavy um, focus on nope that's not right try it again we saw a lot of that it was and that's that's feedback in the sense that you've told them they didn't do it correctly but you've not actually provided any feedback that's useful and constructive for them to apply the next time around so we saw a lot of that um and, and focused in our feedback sessions on providing uh, specific information on which step or which component of the skill uh, we'd like you to give the feedback on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my, my first question was um, regarding feedback and giving specific information, um, detailing the stuff that they did well, the steps or the techniques they did well. And then giving them more structured feedback about what they could fix. My question was, is there a benefit or how much benefit is there if you let them struggle? If you let them struggle through or give them, you know, less specifics uh, and let them kind of work it out. And Mm -hmm. is there a time and a place for that? Yeah, I think there is a time and a place for that. But I, I don't think that that's a... Uh, a useful approach for beginners in particular. Um, So letting them struggle is probably just going to lead to them developing bad habits uh, without, without the the corrective feedback. But when you have, and it, it depends on whether or not the cadet has a, an understanding of what the skill is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to accomplish. Um, because I, I saw in, in some trainings, the cadets didn't really grasp what the end result was supposed to be. They, um, so letting them struggle through it didn't result in anything constructive because they, hadn't, they didn't have a good grasp on, on what they were trying to accomplish with the skill. Right. Um, so, and, and all of this comes... It always comes back to shaping as well, because let's say they're making it through, let's say there are 10 steps in the skill, and they're making it to step five. And right at step five is when they start struggling, and the rest of the skill is just, it's not there. Well, if you focus on step eight, and you skip over six and seven uh, in your feedback, then they're probably still going to get stuck at step five, they might get step eight when it gets to that point, but they're still missing those pieces that you miss. So it's more often than not better to focus on exactly the points when the skill starts, um, when their performance starts to, uh, or when they start missing a step, pick it up right when they make that first mistake instead of letting them complete the entire skill and, and practice an inaccurate version of the skill. Right, so if, if you let them kind of struggle through it multiple times, well, those are all practice opportunities, and they might just be building a bad habit. So if you can stop them right right at the point, though, or just after the point that they make that first mistake and give them the feedback right then and there, you're going to gradually build the skill up and, and shape it into the, um, the, the end behavior that you're looking for. Is that, is that making sense? Yeah, and so a follow-up question on that would be, Let's say uh, a basic cadet is at an academy for four, six, eight months, something like that. 
at what point do you think in the academy it's appropriate to start dialing back on the specifics of the feedback and letting them kind of learn from those? So, for example, if we've given them uh, specific directed feedback about the technique uh, that we that we're looking for them to perform for the first couple of months, mm-hmm. the last two months, can we taper that off? And, and then again, allow them to kind of struggle and learn through some trial and error in there. So is, is the trial and error occurring in the, the normal training setting? Or are you talking about like uh, scenario based opportunities and things like that? Well, let's that? say both. Okay. With, with the scenarios, if they, if you, if they've already demonstrated the skill and you know that it's they can perform the skill, then maybe it's it's acceptable to let them kind of struggle through and see how that skill works in an actual scenario. Okay. Um, but if they're still struggling with the basics of the skill without some other form of corrective feedback, it's not likely that they're going to figure it out. Um, and other forms of feedback might be recording them and showing them the video footage and pointing out exactly, okay, so I've given you this feedback a few times, but here's you on video, and let's pause it right at the point that you make the error and say, okay, this is exa- this is the point where the sk- where things start going wrong. So this is what we're trying to fix. Um, but without without corrective feedback of some sort, and may, I, maybe it comes from the person that they're you know you guys team up uh, into pairs a lot. Maybe that feedback starts to come from the other cadet if that person is is already proficient in the skill, and they can okay. and they can point out when their when their partner is uh, starting to make errors. Um, so I don't I don't think it necessarily has to come from the instructor all the time. But so if you, if you've given the same cadet the same feedback, you know, ten times um, over repeated attempts at performing the skill, then. Maybe you do need to switch up where that feedback comes from. Maybe it, it comes from a, a video recording. Maybe it comes from uh, the cadet. Or maybe you ask them to reflect on, on their own performance and say, you know, what, where do you feel like uh, things start to get difficult or, or where, where are you struggling in this skill? And maybe they're able to give you some input uh, into why they're, they're having difficulty with the, the performance. So that's excellent. The, uh, a couple of those things are things we're we're doing already in different venues, or um, not. I don't want to say sporadically, but you know, as needed. We've started filming the students, for example, on the firearms range. Um, not every single thing that they do, but for example, if, a, if an instructor is working working with a specific student. Uh, and, and they're noticing something. I know that I've done it and I've seen other instructors do it uh, where we'll take an iPad or an iPhone or some other type of tablet device and, mm-hmm. and film that student. And then when they're done and they, and they rotate out to, for example, you know, top off their magazines with more ammunition, uh, we'll, we'll pull them aside for a, a minute or two and be like, I want you to watch this video and then you tell me what you think you need to fix. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've been toying with that. Uh, but right now it's it's a little unguided, and so that's one of the reasons I wanted to ask you this. So then, here's my second follow up question, which is, what about what I would call feedback overload, M- meaning mm-hmm. the instructor who pulls a student aside and goes, "All right, let's talk about these ten problems you have yeah. to deal with." <laughs> yeah. Kind of what's my and that's kind of our, our our little inside joke around here is we once we were evaluating an instructor who. Um, wanted to get a job here full time and, and we gave them a situation to evaluate and they pulled the student aside and they were like, okay, 10 things. And we were like, Oh no, that's too many. <laughs> uh, but then yeah. the question is, what is the right number? You know, um, you mentioned earlier that we obviously don't want to skip, you mm-hmm. know, if, if they're messing up, let's say steps five, eight and nine, well, we don't want to skip step five and then only talk about eight and nine, but if you only have a finite amount of time in order to give that feedback in order to make sure that the training kind of keeps rolling along, which I know is, you know, that's the balance that we always struggle with is how much time should we spend on feedback versus how much time should we spend on participating and practicing? And so I guess my question is, you know, what's that balance look like for um, 
for you and especially in the research that you guys have done or even just your insights from from you know your own um experiences yeah so that's yeah that's a really good question because at all of the the sites that we worked with we identified critical steps of each skill um so i would imagine that if a cadet is struggling on a particular skill and you only have a finite amount of time and and attempts that they can make on the skill, uh, you would want to focus on those critical aspects. So, for example, with a baton strike, we we identified the the twisting of the waist to generate the power is critically important because you can flail around with the baton all you want. If you're not not creating power with it, it's not going to, to be effective, right? So... So maybe yeah. that's if, if, if somebody is struggling with a baton strike, for example, maybe you focus on the twisting of the of the waist to, to create the torque necessary to create power. And, and that's the, the most important aspect that you need them to grasp. And then they can refine the rest of it as, uh, you know, uh, once they graduate or or uh, in subsequent um, feedback sessions. Um, so, yeah, I think. Um, I think we we do have to identify those critical steps because it seems like most skills have something like that where if you miss step five, for example, it doesn't matter if you perform the rest of the skill correctly because you've already been overpowered or your strike has been ineffective or you've put yourself in a position where the rest of the skill isn't even possible because of your body position or something like that. Um, So yeah, maybe identifying... And breaking and this this comes back to to our our studies. We we created task analyses, which is basically just a step by step guide to the skill. And yep. from that, we were able to further break it down and identify the pieces that are that are really critical. That if you miss, uh, you know, step two and step five, doesn't matter if you have the rest of it um, because you've already put put yourself in a position um, that's that's not going to work. Um, so I think, yeah, identifying critical steps would be one. What was the other um, aspect of your, your question? It's just a matter of how, like how much, how much, either how much time or how many things, because I think you mm. and I both oh, yeah, agree yeah. that we don't want to bombard them and just, and, you know, that's one of the things that when I'm working with, because, you know, I spend most of my time trying to refine my instructors so the instructors can work with the students. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things we have to talk about is is that, you know, that feedback overload where they're just like, all right, I want to talk about everything that went wrong instead of focusing on, like you said, the critical points. Mm -hmm. And so my, the debate that always comes up with my instructors is, well, these things all seem critical to me. I think I need to talk about all of them. Right. Then they're spending, for example, in scenario training, you know, they might spend 12 minutes on a debrief and you might think, well, that's not that long, but the scenario was only like two and a half minutes. Right. Yeah. And it's like, we got to get to other scenarios. We got to, we got to move on. And so, um, what do you think is kind of that, uh, the boundaries on which uh, an instructor should stay within? Cause I'm just doing all this off based on my own intuition, just from years of experience. Yeah, and I think a lot of the time it does come down to that because I'm sure you have cadets where you can give them four or five different pieces to work on and they can adapt and and correct their, their performance, whereas uh, you might have a cadet who's just really struggling with a single step and that's the big hurdle for them uh, in in learning that skill. So I think it's prob- it probably needs to be tailored uh, to the cadet and, and their difficulty in performing the skill. But also when you, when we think about those task analyses and breaking the, the skills down into discrete steps, we also found that there were um, sort of, the, there was a progression to each of the skills and you could kind of, let's say there were 15 steps. There might be five groups of three steps where, you know, um, there's the control, like for disarming, for example, there's the rotation, there's spinning. If it's a um, disarming from, you know, the person has the firearm pointed in between their shoulder blades kind of thing. Um, right. There's the rotation. There's the contact and control of the arm. There's the stripping of the weapon. There's the um, 
moving out of range and and pushing away from the individual those are all individual groups of steps that have two or three individual steps within them so so maybe maybe looking at at the task analysis of the skill that you're that you're talking about and let's say uh, there's a group of, of three steps involved in stripping the firearm, and I'm going to focus my feedback entirely on that until you get that, and then we can move on to the, the next piece. Uh, but I can't imagine that providing feedback on two or three steps at a time, anything more than that would seem like a difficult ask for, for a cadet to address all in one, one feedback session. Yeah, so that's where we are. Is uh, so it's actually it's funny that we're having this conversation because this is the I taught at Ilita a couple of years ago, and uh, this is kind of the central point of my of my uh, little class I gave there, which was you know what have we learned here from where I work from doing literally thousands of scenarios a year, um, and one of the things that we you know, just intuitively have kind of seen and that's why i was hoping um we could talk about it because like i said this is just you know our best guess based on trial and error is if you have to talk about more than three things that's probably about your limit Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to stick between one and three and then let's give them an opportunity to do it again Mm -hmm. and then maybe you know if that fourth thing that you wanted to talk about wasn't addressed in that second or third scenario uh, whether that's a live scenario or a video scenario simulation, like in a Milo or a virtual system, then, you know, then we could talk about that fourth thing that you want to talk about. But uh, we try to limit it to no more than two or three topics at most, mm-hmm. just because, like you said, the student is like, okay, I have to remember these these eight things that they want me to fix. Yeah, and, and if those just, if those three pieces of feedback. Uh, fall in line with what they already know how to do. So let's they're they're getting steps one through five correct every time, and then your feedback is on six, seven, and eight. That's going to be a lot easier for them to build off of than if you go they they know one through five and you're given feedback on eight, nine, and ten. Um, right. Though that six and seven in between there, that gap that you've uh, that you've either glossed over or just haven't addressed yet is probably going to throw them off for those last three pieces that you're you're given the feedback on so again that goes back to shaping and gradual improvement of the skill um at, like you're saying a lot of instructors want to try and give feedback on the entire skill but it's it's about incremental increases and right and moving in in the the logical order of the the steps for the skill excellent well, that's good to hear. I mean, it sounds like we're we're doing. I mean, we seem to be on a pretty good path. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you're you're doing exactly what um, you didn't even need to ask my feedback. Sounds like you're doing it already. <laughs> hey, there's there's nothing wrong with some confirmation. Confirmation. There. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know what? Quite and quite honestly, it's funny because a lot of research studies have come out in the last few years that. Again, as as longtime officers and longtime trainers, we all intuitively knew uh, that came up and just, you know, we were able to to kind of point at it and go, we we knew it, we told you. Mm -hmm. Um, And both of those actually were some Paul Taylor stuff, uh, the dispatch priming study. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we've been telling people for years that, hey, you got to be careful about what, what dispatch tells you because that can, you know, that can cause you to change your response just in literally the way they maybe say it or and and sometimes we want them to change their response based on what the call they're responding to is yeah absolutely so just for the listeners um what we're talking about is basically motivating operations but um scott is talking about when dispatch provides an officer with some information as they're on their way to a call um and how that information, so if they mention a firearm, that officer is automatically looking for a firearm as soon as they show up at the, the scene. But if it was the case that there might be a firearm, that needs to be uh, specified, right? Is, that's kind of what we're getting at. Yeah, and uh, it's one of the things that we we play with here a little bit in scenario training, which is uh, we give them, we have it specifically structured to give them specific 
types of calls in a specific way because we're trying to see if we can either um, elicit the proper response. You know, they show up in the right mindset, the right state of mind Mm -hmm. in order to deal with the situation. Or if we can give them some false positives where it sounds like we're saying one thing, but like you said, uh, there may be a a firearm present and seeing if we can't um, get them to maybe even overreact. And we're not doing it to mess with them. It's because we want them to make sure that they're paying attention to the actual words that are being said by a dispatcher versus, uh, you know, their overall feelings about what the dispatcher said, which is a little bit of a, you know, for a new person, that can be a little bit of a stretch to kind of get that nuance that a dispatcher said, you know, the caller said there may be a firearm versus there is a firearm. Mm -hmm. Uh, The student literally locks onto that word firearm and they all respond the same. Um, And instead of, you know, showing up ready to go, maybe they should show up ready to confirm information you know, and slow things down before they, they run in there and start, uh, for lack of a better word or a better phrase, kicking us and taking names. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it is a fascinating, um, <clears throat> line of research. And I, I wonder what the, the overall impact is and, and how often that type of information really does change the behavior of, uh, officers as they arrive on the scene. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of long-time officers will tell you that based on what dispatch in from, you know, like I said, it's one of those things where we intuitively knew that when dispatch gives you certain information on the radio, that sometimes sets us up for either success or failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's something that, you know, we hope to share with with dispatch trainers, which we also have uh, at the academy where I work. But at the same time, I want, we always want to make sure the officers know that they should be you know, really thoughtful about what they ask a dispatch to confirm before they arrive on scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the things we're, we're looking at in my venue of, of scenario training, which is, you know, we'll give them information and, and see whether or not they respond correctly to that. Uh, it's interesting because they fluctuate wildly from the beginning of the academy where they, they panic over everything to the end of their training where they actually underreact to things. Mm. And and the thing that I always am concerned about is, is that because we've set them up to mess with them? Because we only do that a couple, two times. Uh, And everything else we give them is just the the correct information on the way in. But uh, I also wonder if some of the other training they received at the academy may be influencing their, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? their response, you know, if we're somehow influencing them to underreact to information that they definitely should pay attention to. Um, yeah, it seems like a sort of a delicate balance, right? You don't want an overreaction. You don't want an underreaction either. But what are what are those those pieces of information that tend to to influence um, a reaction one way or the other over or underreacting? Right. I think one of the things that we we have to constantly remind ourselves where I work is that we have to remember that, for example, the academy or a training class, you know, if it's an, if it's a, uh, a training that just the agency is doing in house, um, that's not the end all be all. The, the, the officers, once they get on the street, they're also learning as they participate in, in, you know, actual events in the world. And, mm-hmm. uh, we constantly try to remind ourselves that, you know, one of the things that will will help them is just that real live experience on the street, which is why I think, you know, field training is so important um, after they're done. And even after they're done with field training, they probably should be debriefing with their partners about how situations when I think um, that's that's really important for the listeners is to be remembering that, even though we're talking about academy training right now, there's nothing that says that these lessons can't be learned. Even if you've been on the road for five or 10 years uh, of being thoughtful and giving yourself that feedback or you and your partner can look at a situation and give yourself feedback. And one of the things that, that I constantly remind people is just because you had a good outcome doesn't mean you, you followed good practices Mm. and we should be thoughtful about that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you can sort of 
fumble your way through a situation and have a, a good outcome, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, performed at a high level, right? Right. Uh, exactly. I agree. Well, we um, see, so we see this, we have the same problem in behavior analysis. Uh, many of the people in our fields work with people with disabilities, uh, with severe problem behavior, self-injury and that sort of thing. And they too are expected to learn a lot of the ins and outs and intricacies of the job, uh, after training. So, um, they too require a lot of, um, follow-up training and um uh what did you what did you call it um debriefing uh following critical incidents and okay what did we do correctly here what what's um what could we do better next time and uh, the, the place that i work we actually have the the benefit of video surveillance so we can pull events up and and see from multiple angles exactly what happened um That's which cool. which i would imagine um you're able to do it to a certain extent with uh, with the body cams and whatnot, but we know there are limitations with those, and they only show certain angles, and they miss they miss bits and pieces of the the interaction. But uh, right, yeah, there is there is that expectation in our field too that your your learning doesn't stop with uh, with the end of training and graduation. There's um, it's an ongoing thing, and and no matter how many years you've been in the the business, uh, so to speak, there's always, there are always opportunities to get better and to continue learning. I, I completely agree. In fact, I, I listened to a podcast, uh, not yours, obviously. Uh, have you heard of Brian Willis? He's out of Canada. Yes. Uh, I don't know why I know his name, uh, but yes, maybe he was uh, part of a force science class. That's possible. He is very involved in Ilita. Um, I think he might be the president of Ilita right now. I wish I could. Well, Brian's going to be like, I'm so disappointed. But I can um, picture I his thought, face too. He has like a goatee, right? Uh, yeah, I think. And so he does yeah. a lot of training with Ilita. He is from Canada. I think he's done some work with Force Science. But the reason I bring him up is because he did a podcast a little while back with a. Um, I'm, somebody who works with the Colorado state police and she actually does what we're talking about, which is they do debriefs on um, actual events and they get the video footage from use of force situations and they do full on debriefs. Even if it didn't result in a, uh, in a disciplinary issue or a legal issue or a civil issue, they just, you know, they're constantly trying to learn from their own performance and whether that's, you know, positive performance or negative performance but i i just think that that's really a powerful tool that i wish more agencies would take the opportunity to use um, yeah. i know you know mm-hmm. I, as i don't i'm no longer on the road full-time uh, as in i'm not on the road at all anymore because my full-time job is just teaching uh which i love but you know i i'm not participating in that anymore but you know we still do this with the students all the time we'll pull new videos off the street and be like let's watch what happened with you know this officer in this agency and let's go through the steps and and uh i constantly am telling my students remember it's more about process than it is about outcome because you can luck your way through one good you know one situation that that went well for you but you can't do it over a career you've got to have good processes and and good uh you know operations yeah, and I mean, video footage has to be one of the the most underutilized uh, technologies, I think, for, for corrective feedback. Um, but, man, I can see so much progress being made with, like, drone footage and, and the different um, uh, surveillance cameras that are, that are kind of posted up around cities and things. As, the, right. as that technology gets better and we're able to clearly see incidents on evolve or uh, evolve um yeah i think that that's going to be fantastic for people to be able to go back and look at their own performance look at other people's performance in in crazy situations and uh and have that a little bit of foresight about about what what happens during those those incidents right i mean sports teams have been doing it for years so yeah, i just exactly you know, yeah uh so I, I have other questions I want to get to, though. Let me look them up really quick, because I had to write them down. I had so many. I think we've covered a few of them, but I was going to ask you about 
what are your uh, feelings on instructor to student ratios? Mm-hmm. And and the reason I ask is because, you know, there's no, this comes up a lot when we're talking about staffing, you know, where I work, but this also comes up a lot, you know, with agencies and things like that about how many students, if we're looking at actually improving performance and giving, you know, good feedback, and I don't mean good as in positive, but I mean good as in effective feedback. Mm -hmm. What does that ratio look like in something like a a defensive tactics room or a firearms range or even, you know, scenario training? I I think we can agree that one to 20 is probably a bad ratio. One to one is probably overkill. So, you know, what, is there any research on that or, or just from your own experience going through, uh, the research at basic academies as you saw what was a good ratio um that seemed to be very effective mm-hmm. assuming they're actually all giving feedback the way that we want yeah assuming yeah assuming that the instructor is giving feedback the the way that you want them to uh i mean like you said one to 20 is is just way too much for any one person to keep track of but I really, I, the more I think about it, it, it really comes down to the baseline performance of the group that, that the instructor has. I mean, if you have, let's say you're, it's one to 10 and you have the 10, you just happen to have the 10 best performer, baseline performers in the class, your job is going to be a lot easier than the other instructor who has 10 folks who are the lowest baseline performers in the class. Right. So it might actually need to be modified based on the performance of the group um so if <clears throat> i mean at one to ten i've seen one to ten occur and that seems to to work uh relatively effectively but it it also comes down to the layout or the the positioning of the instructor in relation to their group as well so i've, I've seen instructors line all of their cadets up in a straight line um I've seen them have their cadets circle them so that they can stand in the middle and sort of rotate around and, and get a get eyes on everyone as they as they kind of you know progress around their group. Okay. Um, that was a pretty cool uh, pretty cool approach, but but then you run the chance of missing uh, something behind somebody you. making an error beside beside you or behind you or just off in your periphery. Um, so. I don't know. There's, there has, uh, not that I'm aware of anyway, there hasn't been any uh, research on that, but I would imagine anything more than one to 10 is going to be very difficult for an instructor to keep track of regardless of the, their positioning in relation to the, to the group. Uh, So I wouldn't recommend more than one to 10. I mean, you said one to one is overkill, but I mean, not really. If it, ideally, right? If if all the funding was there, you'd like to have <laughs> one instructor to to every kid, maybe two instructors, you know, just so you can get both angles. But um, <laughs> I think I think you and I both know that's not the real world. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's absolutely never going to. Well, who knows? Fingers crossed. You know, right. You know. um, so, but yeah, um, one what to, about in? Sen- oh, go ahead. No, sorry. One to one to ten seems like uh, a manageable group at least based on, on my observations. Uh, but anything more than that is it gets real tricky to, to keep track of, especially if you have, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. You know, you have one straggler in the group and you end up spending most of your time with that individual um, as opposed to the, to the rest of the group because you're trying to get them to catch up. Right. Um, but then when, yeah, you, so f- when, you, have, when you have a group of, of, let's say, 10 people like that, maybe two or three of them uh, have... Uh, are performing the skill sufficiently and you and they've, they've done it multiple times maybe you can start using them to give feedback to the lower performers in the group too so it's sort of a, a peer mentoring uh, kind of approach you know once you get checked off by the instructor now your job is to continue performing the skill correctly but also provide uh, feedback to the cadet next to you so that's interesting that was one of the questions that one of my co uh, co-workers and another coordinator he runs the the firearms program, although he he floats around and helps me in scenarios, and occasionally I go and help him in firearms. And uh, one of the questions was that he had was, "What do you think about peer feedback? Um, and what does that look like?" 
Yeah, you're asking about peer feedback. Um, Yeah, peer feedback is another one of those things that I think is very underutilized, at least in in what I've seen of academy training. And it's kind of tricky, right? Because you want to make sure that that peer isn't spreading errors throughout the, the people that they're giving feedback to. Right. So maybe it's not just, oh, you did that correctly once. All right, now you're a peer mentor for the rest of the group. Maybe you want them, <laughs> you know, you want them to do it three times flawlessly sort of thing and really be sure that that uh, that they're they're going to give the right kind of feedback to their to the rest of the group. But yeah, I, I mean, I love it. It's um, uh, peer mentoring or, or uh, uh, peer modeling and feedback is uh, can be very, very useful. And um yeah, do you, did they uh, did the your instructor have a specific question about about whether or aspects of peer feedback or Well, I mean, that's a great I don't think he uh, reiterated that to me. I believe his only question was what does he think about peer feedback? And, yeah, so uh, I love it. Um, it's yeah, I think it can be an incredibly effective uh, uh, way to utilize your your high performing cadets as kind of sub instructors or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's 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 about making sure that they're going to to provide the right kind of feedback to, to right. their their the other cadets. Uh, peer observations as well. Um, that's a I mean somebody who has obviously already mastered the skill and they're good. Um, you know, more, more repetitions and continued practice is only going to make them better at that skill. But, um, I see in your, in the, your notes here, the peer observations as well. So, um, right. maybe they, uh, they start recording, uh, the other, the other cadets performance and, and they can provide feedback, not just verbal feedback, but they can, they can show, uh, videos of their, their fellow cadets performing the skill and, and try to help them, um, work through the skill that way. But then I think it's, it's important to confirm with the, the instructor as well. So, uh, if the, if the peer is going, is providing feedback, just checking in with the instructor, Hey, here's what, uh, here's what we're talking about. This is where, where they're struggling. Um, that's a great point. Is this feedback that I'm giving correct? You know, we just want to make sure and confirm. Um, so that could be really useful as well. I think that's a really good point because I, I do – we've toyed with peer feedback in the past. We've, we've done it here and there, and, and when it works great, it's great, and when it, when it fails, it fails so miserably, and mm-hmm. you know, you'll, uh, you'll step away for a minute. You'll come back, and they'll be like, well, listen up. This, you know, I know they taught us to do this, but this isn't the way I do it, and let me show you this way. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we have to – you know readdress that issue so uh as you said it it, with some oversight i think it's a really good tool yeah and And, then uh, and i like it too so yeah and you can sort of build in some checks and balances with that as well like uh i i toyed with the idea of having a video model um constantly looping and playing you know if you if you were able to project it up on one of the walls in the the training room so yep. that the skill is on a continuous loop. So when when that peer who has already mastered the skill is giving feedback, the person receiving that feedback can check with the video model and make sure, oh, okay, yeah, that is what we're supposed to be doing and that makes sense. And and then they get two different angles. You know, they see their peer performing the skill and they have the, the video model to refer to as well. I like that plan. Uh, we, again, we've been toying with making videos we've actually made videos in the past uh they were a little ad hoc on the fly and so i think we need to spend some more time probably filming them in a more structured way but we we actually already have large uh tvs mounted in the rooms oh nice so we can do that and uh quite frankly it's it's a little bit more of a technology issue because for whatever reason, the Apple TV doesn't want to sync up to the Apple device and <laughs> stay connected all the time. It just uh-huh. gets finicky, a little bit like your regular internet connection, I guess. But um, no, we uh, we've thought about that, and and that's a good suggestion. Yeah, Maybe and showing you know, obviously with with video models, you can show multiple angles. 
You yeah. can show the correct variation. You can show incorrect variations. Uh, I got gotcha. you. You can show multiple people of different size. You know, because some skills look a little bit different when you have a small person with a large person and vice versa. Right. Um, so you can you can give multiple different variations. Yeah. Um, you can also build in directional arrows or rotational arrows to to really uh, highlight, uh, for example, the twist in the waist to, to produce power. Uh, maybe you want to highlight that with a directional or rotational arrow. Um, so you can do cool things like that or even put text up on the, the screen and you can, I mean, obviously you can do slow motion. Uh, yeah. You can show different angles via slow motion and then speed it back up. And um, I mean, I haven't used, I haven't demonstrated anything in reverse, but I could see how it might be useful in showing the connection between, you know, different steps in a skill. Um, there's just a lot of things that you can do that you can't do in real life with video modeling. Right. No, I, I completely agree. And I think that's a, a great idea. Um that we, like I said, we've been talking about it. I think the number one issue that's going to be true for most agencies, most academies is just what is your, what is the time budget and your monetary budget in order to create those videos? It's mm-hmm. one thing that, you know, film it with a, a phone or a tablet and then throw it up on the screen. It's another to add those things. And you'll need someone who's, who's pretty good at that kind of, yeah. uh, you know, editing and, and, uh, video work, but I, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, and, uh, we're, we're definitely pushing forward with that. Um, let's see, I just had a couple last questions and then if you have any questions for me, I'd love to answer them. Well, let me throw this one in really quick. Cause it, it kind yeah. of builds off of the, this, this feedback piece. Have you, so the trainings that I've seen, most of the feedback comes verbally, right? Have you, I, ever thrown around the idea of using a really discreet sound to reinforce the uh, correct behavior. So do you mean like your clicker that you guys were mentioning in the feedback episode? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Clicker, right. It's, I mean, it sounds silly, but it removes the necessity of a pause in the performance by the cadet, right? So they can continue performing the skill, but they hear that click and they know they're correct up until that point. Um, you could so we e- haven't... Go ahead. I was going to say, we haven't played with that at all yet. What, we, what we've what we been doing is the thing that you... The other things that you and Dawn mentioned, which is either nonverbal feedback, a nod, a look, uh, mm-hmm. kind of a motion with the hand, like a go ahead, um, or... For example, in the scenario training environment where we do most of um, my section, it's they're, they're just one word, and they're not really pauses. We're not stopping the scenario. Uh, and this is something I talked about at Ailita, which is you know, just a word like good or nice. Um, so they get that, that positive, I, I can continue, this is going well. Or if it's corrective... Uh, we might just give them a one word, uh, what I call prompt, Mm -hmm. which is if they're, for example, they're in a scenario where there's obvious uh, hard cover positions that will will stop bullets or create a barrier between a a suspect that's got a gun or a knife, uh, but they're not utilizing it, we'll just go, we'll just say the word cover. And we're not telling them, hey, you should go right or left. And, you know, we're not pausing it and pointing at it. We're just although we actually do in the very, very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. But after day one, where we've paused them and said, look around, what do you see? Do you like where you are? From that point forward, it's just, we'll just say cover or, um, or look. And, and that's the way we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have not toyed around with the clicker. And one of the reasons is because quite frankly, in the scenario training environment we're doing, we introduce a lot of, after the first couple of days, a lot of background noise, a lot of distractions. Mm, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have other people in the scenario that that are not the suspect, maybe having a conversation or talking or, or maybe just being a, a minor nuisance. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I'm a little concerned they wouldn't hear a clicker. Yeah, right. Um, however, and again, you know, like I'm thinking the firearms range between the gunshots and the 
and the timers and the turning targets and mm-hmm. people dropping magazines. I'm not sure they would hear it. I think yeah, it'd probably right. be best done either in defensive tactics uh, or in what we consider a fragment drill. So those are short mini drills and it's not a full scenario. They are a fragment of a scenario, either the very beginning or the very end or maybe the middle where we only work on one piece of whatever it is those students have been working on. Those scenarios are a lot lower stress or a lot quieter. Same thing with DT training, maybe. maybe. Yeah, right. I was yeah, I was starting to think about the the DT training sessions, and those can get pretty rowdy and and noisy as well. So, right. And we we've been um, our DT coordinator has been doing a really good job, kind of introducing additional layers of complexity to the same skill. So, for example, if they've learned. Um, pummeling and grappling and, and working uh, on controlling the limbs in the the square rectangular mat room that's nice and controlled. Once they've started to grasp that, then we take them out in the grass mm-hmm. and then we'll take them out in the gravel and, and then we'll put them on a bus. And, you know, we start introducing those additional environmental things. I know that like when they're in the gravel, it is noisy. Is there, is oh, there yeah, yeah, sure. moving around? So no, those, this, yeah, those are really, really good points. And, uh, so a lot of, a lot of folks in, in my fields, uh, do talk about the, the clickers and the discreet, uh, discreet reinforcers like that, that are very obvious, but you make excellent points on the, the limitations of it because, Oftentimes these training sessions are quite noisy. There's a lot of other things going on, and and those uh, those clicks or or maybe it's a light or whatever it might be could go unnoticed. Whereas the cadets, for the most part, tend to recognize and pay attention to the instructor's voice when they hear it. Right, especially if you give them a little like you like you said, and it's something that our more experienced instructors will do, which is like a shoulder tap or a touch and, and, you know, just that Mm -hmm. combination with the like good job or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where we try to to do it. I will say uh, just as a funny side note for instructor training um, or scenario training, we actually have to be careful about when we touch the students during scenarios because I've had a few instructors get shot like a point blank range with a simunition round. Yikes. um, As they startled. Uh, a student that was mm-hmm. a little more excited than we thought they were. Yeah, yeah, sure. And they thought they were being attacked from second from second direction. So uh, I've had to tell my guys and, and my girls that work for me, I'm like, hey, maybe, maybe don't sneak up on them and touch them. <laughs> um, as, a, as a few of my instructors got shot in the neck. Um, the one place they're not wearing any protective gear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you go paintballing and you get shot right in the throat. Oh, God, it's the worst. So uh, that leads me to a different question, though, which is how do you feel about, for example, in classroom instruction, uh, we have, I'm not very good at it yet, and I'll just throw that out there, but we have some other instructors who have started toying with um, giving feedback in the classroom with, like, for example, uh, Kahoot is the program, but like small low stakes, just question and answer, like game Mm -hmm. type things. How do you feel about that as a, as a mechanism for feedback where the students, you know, I don't have to call them out and say, Hey, student 12 in the back of the room, you did terrible, (laughs) but they can, you know, we'll do a couple questions every, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. We'll pull up a couple of Kahoot questions and, Mm -hmm. and be like, all right, let's just check your, check your knowledge and have you guys answer this. How do you feel about that as a feedback tool? I think it's fantastic. I use it in in my own classroom training or really? teaching. Yeah, so I'll I'll have frequent breaks and just have a a couple of uh, sort of um, probing questions just to see if they're on the same page. And you know, occasionally I'll ask a question and I just get blank looks, and I know I I lost them. <laughs> you know, I I lost them at some point in the last fifteen minutes, and and probably need to reiterate or get their get their attention back on track. Uh, but yeah, frequent little little uh, questions like that, and if you can turn it into a game, even better. You know, split the class into two and have them compete against each other for points based on on those oh. questions. 
I haven't uh, thought about that. Yeah, turn it into a game and get some friendly competition going. Uh, I know you and I talked uh, quite a bit about you know uh, public posting of performance and and how that can create competition, friendly competition between the cadets. And then there's there's always the concern of uh, identifying individuals, but that's easily solved. You break them up into groups and you just provide the, the group average. You don't have to single out any particular person. Uh, but yeah, anytime you can make it into a bit of a competition or a game, uh, it definitely um, gains more attention and, and, uh, and gets people more actively involved in the learning process. Well, that's, that's excellent. I, uh, I like that. I, like I said, I'm not very good at it yet, mostly because I have a hard time structuring the questions um, in a short format. I'm, I'm much more of a watch this scenario and tell me what you think person. Mm. But um, I, I've seen it work really, really well. So we're going to be doing more of that. And then I, th- I think I really only have one more question for you, uh, which you just mentioned, which is just kind of feeding off of, of the, the public posting of scores. Uh, what do you think about grading things like scenarios and or defensive tactics? I mean, firearms is easy, right? Mm-hmm. The holes are either in the right area or they're not in the right area. But, you know, I spend a lot of my time in a scenario environment or in a um, in an environment where it's a little more murky as far as grading performance. And it's the number one challenge we've run into is we've created a, a metric that that we feel captures performance of students in most scenarios, but man, getting instructors to really be critical and think about when they fill in that box, you know, about what score to give them Mm -hmm. uh, is really tough. And I'm just wondering what your opinion is on using a rubric for scoring, for example, scenario performance, which is complex. You know, it's, it's Mm -hmm. hard to say how well a student did when you send them in and they got to deal with, you know, uh, a dynamic uh, situation. Yeah, I think uh, I think it again comes down to those critical aspects of a scenario or or a skill. Um, you know, most of the the skills involved in our studies had anywhere from ten to thirty individual steps. And that's a lot for an instructor to keep track of in the moment. It was easy for us, you know, with the with the video footage that we had of, of yep. all of the, the sessions. But how do you how do you whittle that task analysis down into its uh, core components and, and critical pieces? Right. And and so maybe you maybe you, you have to do that and you break it down into five pieces that are really the most important components of that skill and maybe the instructor grades off of that um and then scenarios you know thinking about and i'm sure you already do this but maybe it's just formalizing it into a a score sheet but what are the the critical pieces of this scenario that um you know maybe there's something that if you make this mistake the rest of the scenario is out the window kind of thing yeah, so uh, it's funny that you say that because you know that's that's actually what we've done is we we created a uh, a rubric uh, with five points that we think are relatively universal, mm-hmm. um, which are you know we look at the first one is are they making legal choices are they are they violating the law? Or are they not? And, you know, mm-hmm. that one seems pretty easy because people are like, well, you know, in scenarios, most of the time the officers are doing the right thing. But there's a second element to that, which is, can they tell you mm-hmm. that, you know, can they articulate it to you what they did? Because step one is I do the right thing in the field. Step two is I get the right thing down on paper. If it was a use of force, you know, where I, I have to maybe throw somebody on the ground or can I articulate it to somebody during a uh, during an interview, for example, if it's a deadly force or it's a critical incident, um, you know, they may not be writing a report on that, but they need to still be able to talk about it with some level of articulation. Mm-hmm. And so that for us is number one, which is for me, that's the kind of critical failure point. If they obviously if they commit a crime, if they have if they blatantly violate somebody's civil rights in a scenario, well, what's what's really the point of talking about anything else? You just you just committed a crime. Yeah, right. Um, most of the time that doesn't happen. 
and which is why you know the second element of that is can they are can they articulate it the yeah, second one is it's kind of the they, difference between it's similar to the difference between recognition and recall right like yep. um, you're able to perform a skill but are you able to explain why you engaged in that particular skill at that right. particular point it's a little bit along the the lines of recognition versus recall but yeah it's a different type of uh it's a different type of skill um and i think you see that in instructors sometimes too they're they're very um very good at performing a skill but not as good at teaching other people how to perform that skill Right. Do you do you see that? I mean. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, we frequently see high performing individuals, people who are either excellent shooters or they're they're fantastic martial artists of some kind, whether it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or uh, Judo or something else, you know, and they're and they're just brilliant practitioners. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then we bring them in to try and instruct it and they, and they can't figure out how to explain anything or, uh, they explain it in a way that's just a total turn off to the student. And, mm-hmm. and the funny thing is that we always joke about, which is sometimes our, our mediocre performers, you know, I qualify fine. I score in the high, you know, the mid to high nineties every time, no matter what, but I've never gotten a hundred percent on the qualification that we run. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't, I can't teach it. And then we have other folks who come in and they just crush the qualification, you know, and they, they could score hundred percent at halftime, but man, they, they just turn the students off every time they talk to them. Oh, yeah. It's a different and skill set, right? Yeah. It's exactly right. It's a different school skill set. And so that is the balancing act, right? You've got to be able to perform at an, at an adequate skill level, preferably a step or two better than the students can perform. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's more important that you can articulate what it is you're trying to get them to do, or you can, you know, get that message across in a way that's both effective um, as far as getting them to do it. You know, I I, need to be able to know the steps, but also in a way that doesn't turn the students off. Cause Mm -hmm. we've also seen that where, uh, like they can explain the steps really well, but they come across as so arrogant that the students are like, I have no interest in listening to you. So, you know, it, again, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, yeah. And maybe those, those people who are able to pick the skill up and master it really quickly, they haven't had to adapt their approach and, and, um, and adjust because they picked it up so quickly. Like I think of, uh, I don't know why he's coming to mind, but the the Deontay Wilder uh, Tyson Fury fight, where right. you know Wilder's has, his entire career has just been walking forward and knocking people out, and <laughs> that didn't that didn't work with Tyson Fury, and he was unable to adapt to that situation because he was just doing what he's always done and it's always worked before, uh, yep. and wasn't able to adjust in that moment. Um, so maybe that's one of the issues with really high performers is that they, they haven't been thrown curveballs that they had to adjust to. Right. Uh, it's funny you say that. We, have, we actually sometimes will see that with students where a, uh, a student will come in and you could tell this student has been a rock star mm-hmm. probably their whole life. You know, they were probably a, um, you know, on the varsity, whatever sports team they played on, they probably went to college on a scholarship for sports. Uh, they've been a martial artist for forever. You know, they're, they're, um, they're just physically gifted. And then we put them in a scenario or we put them in, um, even a defensive tactics, uh, we call them evos or evolutions where they really have to go against somebody who's as good as them. We match them up based on skill level, uh-huh. often for the physical evos, and and they don't know how to manage it. They, uh, I've actually had some students break down and just uh, shut shut themselves off, and they're and they don't know how to handle failure, mm-hmm. um, which I think is important because it's one thing to be the the top dog in your high school, or your college. It's another thing to be the top dog over a 25 year career. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we constantly tell people, and, and I think they, they consciously get it, but they don't get it until it happens to them. 
you know, at a visceral level, which is there's always going to be somebody better than you. There's always going to be somebody bigger than you. I don't know when you're going to encounter them. But it will happen you're at some come. point, yeah. Yeah, it, it will happen at some point, you know. And for some students, uh, and for some, you know, like you said, maybe those students become better instructors. Maybe they've always had to struggle. I know I, I'm, you know, I might be a tall, big guy, but I've never been the most athletic person so for me to play sports or for me to participate in, in the tiny amount of martial arts that I've done, uh, which has primarily been regulated to defensive tactics training, I, I've never been the best. So I've always had to kind of work at it and try different things and experiment. And, and I'm used to not doing great. And maybe that helps me out. I'm not really sure, but I, I would hope so. Yeah, we saw, you know, there was a lot of variation in the, the performance of, uh, you know, pre and post training uh, performance for the cadets. And those people who started out as the top performers didn't always end up the top performers. You know, some of those middle of the road folks and even the low performers really uh, took the corrective feedback and, and made the best of it and ended up performing at the level or, or even higher than some of the, the folks who came in with pretty decent performance to begin with. So yeah, there's definitely something to be said to uh, providing challenges regardless of um, the cadet's skill level. I completely agree. Uh, that kind of brings me to something that you said, which now, of course, as we went off on a tangent, I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, oh, it was about it was about the rubric we use in getting my instructors to grade the students on those those topics. The other things that we look at are things such as the students' performance of the actual skill. So, for example, in a in a scenario um, in a scenario where we know they're going to be engaged in a deadly force encounter, we know they're going to have to draw their their simulated you know simulation firearm and uh use it well we know what a draw stroke looks like and i know what accuracy is and so uh those are the things that will grade but we also grade on tactics and that gets a little more murky and that's where my instructors start to i don't want to say fall apart but but struggle mm. which is they're like well they kind of moved to cover is that good performance i mean they moved to the wrong piece of cover they moved to a cover that was basically at knee height, but at least they went there. Uh, so do I score them high because they went to cover? And that's where I think there needs to be some some variation in, in the scoring. Mm. We actually at one time tried to create a scoring system that was very specific to the scenario. But what we discovered was sometimes the students would not follow the script, for lack of a better word. Uh, they would they would do something completely unexpected. And it wasn't that it didn't work. It was just something that we were like, oh, right, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting way to solve that problem. Yeah, right. That, uh, we didn't really think of, and now I don't know how to score this because it's very specific, which is why we came up with a, a much more generic kind of overall mm -hmm. score for, you know, legal actions, skills and tactics. We just had to break it down because one, one officer's skills and tactics might be drawing a taser, backing off and using cover. Another officer's skills and tactics might be moving forward getting a hold of that person controlling the limbs and, and going for either a body lock or a takedown or, um, yeah, that's tough because the, the scenario isn't going to be run exactly the same way every time either. Right. They're going to be right. little, and, little variations that might, uh, might, uh, serve as a prompt for, for one cadet to do one behavior and for somebody else to do something else. Yeah, and, and that comes down to that totality of the circumstances that we would look at in a use of force environment, which is, you know, just just varying the size of the role player versus the size of the student officer mm -hmm. right there changes the tactics that they should engage in. And so, you know, we needed to come up with a grading system that was that was modifiable enough each time that we could capture, okay, not the way I thought you were going to handle that, but that was a good you know, use of the taser, you drew it well, you had it, you know, at a low ready at the appropriate points, you uh, pointed it at the, at the suspect and at the proper points um, versus another officer who comes in, who's maybe a lot larger and maybe the suspect is smaller 
And uh, we happen to know that that officer is you know, very good at defensive tactic skills, and they may opt to not use the taser at all, which is you know perfectly perfectly fine. And they may move in and just control that person. And so uh, those are the kind of variations that we had to kind of manage. And uh, yeah, that's <clears throat> it's tough go ahead. because I I can definitely see how success in a in any particular scenario is kind of a moving target based on multiple variables that are that are going on during the scenario right Um, so how did uh, how did you guys end up addressing that issue or is that something you're still trying to work through well i think we've come up with a good a good plan for it which is like i said we we just leave it open-ended we just have a category for skills and tactics Mm -hmm. and and it's just a it's just a very simple scoring you know we used to try to do a one through five score uh but what we learned was you know i'm looking at the data and i'm i'm looking at all my instructors and they're like they give everybody a two a three or a four uh you know somebody getting a one and somebody getting a five was pretty rare uh and i'm like 80 80 to 85 percent of my scores are two threes and fours Mm -hmm. so i just went all right then you guys want to you want to score that way then let's do it that way and i lopped off um, I lopped off the one and the five and, uh, now everyone's a two. <laughs> well, no, I just said, uh, if you just want to stay in a, in a three scale system, let's yeah, just do right, that. Right. And then what we actually did is, is we created a zero one, two. Um, and it, and that's where it threw them. And I said, look, if it, if it would have been a, a three or a four, give them a one. If it would have been a, a four or a five, give them a two. You know, did they do really well? And they're like, yeah, they did really well. I'm like, that's a two. And they're like, but there is this one thing. And I was like, okay, then they're a one. Mm-hmm. You know, it, they either they either did it poorly, right? We had poor performance, uh, and and we're not looking at outcome. And that's the thing that I have to keep trying to get my my staff on board with is I'm I'm less concerned with the outcome. I'm more concerned with did they make the right decisions and did they, you know, have good performance? Yeah. And so uh, sometimes right. even if they do all the right things, they may still, the student may still get shot a lot in the scenario. And I'm like, all right, but did they move to cover? They're like, yeah. I'm like, how was their draw stroke? There was like, it was good. Mm-hmm. How was their accuracy? It was good. Did they, uh, did they appropriately assess that they were hit? And when the time was right, to put on a tourniquet because we do a lot of tourniquet training with, training tourniquets Mm -hmm. and they're like yeah and i'm like okay then they get it too they're like but they got shot i'm like sometimes people get shot you know i can't prevent every if our scenario goal is the student never gets shot well then i need to reduce the fidelity of that scenario to the point where it's probably not very realistic so you know we we stick to the procedures the tactics the skills and uh, and we look at them in in the broad categories of you know did they make legal de- good legal decisions and can they at least in the most basic sense articulate those and I know that there's a there's a different skill set there with this recall versus performance but in the real world you got to be able to do both mm-hmm. and and I've seen it in real life where officers I've been with you know they were fantastic in the field they're great couldn't write a report for their life and they kept losing cases and they kept getting in trouble because it looked like they weren't doing the right thing based mm-hmm. on their, their reports mm-hmm. and they couldn't articulate. So, so, so these scenarios, the both. go ahead. Are they, are they given multiple opportunities in these scenarios, each cadet, or is it sort of a one-time performance? So that's, uh, that's the challenge, right? That comes to my, my staffing issue which is what we would like is um, for use of four scenarios, they participate in either five or six different days of scenarios. And every day they're here, we give them an opportunity to participate in video scenarios and in live scenarios. Um, And each one has, you know, it's pros and cons. And so that's why we try to mix it up every day where they do both. Mm -hmm. And then our goal is to make sure that they get, two to three live scenarios, sometimes four a day and two to three video scenarios a day. So every session they should be getting, you know, between four and six scenarios total 
over six sessions. So, you know, we're hoping that they're graduating with something pretty close to 20-ish use of four scenarios. The problem is we can't make them all be the same scenario. So they're not getting to practice the same deadly force scenario over and over and over again. Yeah, right. Um, and so that's why you need those more general, did they break the law? Did they X, Y, right. Z? Yeah. Yeah. Did they follow what the legal rules are? Did they follow the case law? Are you, I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to think of how you can use the scoring um objectively based on their their past performance so do you know what i mean like uh, multiple yeah. measures of their of that particular cadet's performance so maybe during the first scenario um maybe it's not so much about scoring but identifying the areas that they're struggling in so that when right. they go when they go through scenario two the instructor has a particular eye out for what they did incorrectly the last time. Right. I, I love that. Um, and we try to do that with our verbal debriefs, which is, you know, well, we have the benefit of filming all the live scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. The room is too dark for the video scenarios at this time. We're hoping to be, we're hoping we're getting some new systems here pretty soon. And, uh, and they'll have video playback built into the system. Mm hmm but we like that ability to kind of show them the video and go watch this and, and tell me what you thought and then let them kind of lead us through the, through the debrief. And then we can bring up the points that we thought were important, mm -hmm. uh, kind of going all the way back to the beginning of our, uh, our feedback conversation at the beginning. But we do hope that we could, you know, at the end of every one, we could say, okay, what's something you want to work on for next time? And, and then what I'd like is we would make a note on their file because we actually score them in a computer database and, and it tracks the whole time they're here. So I can look at their day one scenario, one performance oh, nice. and go, Oh, it says right here that they're, they, um, they felt like they did a poor job moving the cover. Um, they were in a dynamic deadly force scenario. They had to move around and they thought that they didn't move very well. They ran backwards a lot and kept running into things. And so those are the things we can look at. But it does require, you know, the, the instructor to put that in there. And it does require uh, us to, to go back and look at that. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it requires, it's one of those things it requires that we like to, to do. Yeah, it requires you tailoring uh, the feedback to, to each individual, which obviously can get uh, um, pretty difficult when you have a class of, what do you guys have classes of, 40 to 50 cadets at 40. a time? 40. Yep. Yeah. It's 40. We're hoping at some point to, to drop those down to 32 in the future, mm -hmm. because we do know that, you know, there's a feedback issue. The, the more students you have, the harder it is mm -hmm. to spend any individual time with them when you only have a certain amount of training time. But uh, yeah, it's, it becomes a little difficult, it becomes a little cumbersome. But if there is, like you said, if there is something that really stands out and that's noted uh, during the, the first couple of uh, assessments, then you can obviously track that progress and hopefully they've corrected that issue by the, the ends and they're when they're going through the, the scenarios and, and testing. Yeah. So one of the things we do is we actually ask the students, um, what have you been trying to work on? Mm, you know, nice. what, what have you been um, struggling with and, and trying to improve in your performance here? And, and sometimes they're really good and they have good emotional intelligence and they, and they can bring that up and say, well, you know, the thing that I've been struggling with is, uh, I feel like I have a hard time getting the proper verbal commands out. And I've been really trying to work on making sure that I give good warnings and that they're clear and, and I'm not, you know, overreacting or underreacting. Some of them are great at that and other ones are just overwhelmed and they're like, I'm just trying to survive, man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those ones are, are, are tough because, you know, then it's really instructor dependent and, and because of this, the staffing we have, and I know a lot of agencies have this issue too, where you, maybe you have five, 10, 15 different instructors working with the same student and you may have four instructors who've graded them previously and they all may be looking for slightly different things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the verbal stuff, uh, I was surprised to see, well, maybe not surprised, but it was interesting that the instructors would let, and this was at uh, multiple different sites, but uh, the instructors would allow the cadets at the end of a scenario to say something along the lines of, and then I'd call in 
or I'd call, uh, you know, I'd radio in. Well, okay, but do that, you know, go through yep. that motion, because if you don't practice saying that out loud and going through that, that, the, that verbal repertoire, when you're put in a high stress situation, those words aren't going to come out the way you think they are. Yeah, that, that is exactly right. And we, um, we actually do that. So in the beginning of our scenario training, we just have them tell the instructor, not, not like I would radio in, but we would go go ahead and practice it. And then we, they'd practice mm-hmm. and we make them actually reach up and grab their microphone and, and pretend to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we get further along, we actually throw radios on them and we'll put a student uh, or a small group of students in another room waiting their turn to do something different. And we'll be like, you're the dispatchers. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. what you're listening for. And they have to use the radio and, uh, and the dispatchers, you know, they will hold themselves, hold each other accountable and be like, transmission garbled repeat or they'll say uh you know and they'll know based on their own performance in the scenarios that okay if they said they were in a shooting and the suspect's down uh, we know they should have asked for certain things and all they said was you know suspect down and they haven't said anything else you know they'll ask a clarifying question or two as a dispatcher might like are you okay you know um is anyone injured on scene uh, to kind of prompt the other students. So we, we've we been working really hard on that. And in fact, it's one of the the goals in some of our fragment drills, like I mentioned earlier. If it's, for example, a fragment that's the beginning of a scenario, the student must call in on the radio, even though they don't actually have a radio there. They have to go through the, the transmission. And we have a small checklist of like, okay, these are the four things I'm expecting to hear them say. You know, mm-hmm. they need to give yeah. their location. They need to say they're on scene. They need to say their radio number or their, you know, their call sign. Uh, and then if it's, for example, the fragment at the end, we want them to give a good closing out radio transmission. Right. Uh, so we're, we're doing that a lot more. We, we did recognize that that was something that either students were struggling with or, uh, you know, that we thought that they needed to practice on. And I think it's been very beneficial for them. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, well, Unless you have any other uh, questions, I think. No, um, this has been a great talk, and I, I really appreciate your time. And I'm I'm so thrilled that you and Don are running this podcast. And I've already uh, shipped out several of your episodes to some of my coworkers. And oh, thank you, man. Been like, you gotta it. listen to this one. Uh, so we we've already where I work gotten some benefit out of the work that you and Don are doing. And I just want to tell you how appreciative I am uh, that you guys are doing this because you know we we need more things like this. We need to collaborate more and talk more. And uh, it's great to have a resource like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, the podcasting thing is, is turning out to be just a a great way to, to transmit information and for people to learn from one another. And, you know, I'm really appreciative of everything that you do and always love talking to you, man. You're, uh, you're, uh, you know, going through this conversation, you're already doing a lot of the stuff that, that I would recommend. So it's, it's fantastic to see, uh, to see you guys, uh, actually applying that stuff. And anytime we can help just, uh, you know, give us a shout and, and we'll do whatever we can to, to assist. Of course. Um, and so, same yeah. thing over here. If you guys, uh, want feedback from people who are actually trying to do it day in and day out or see how things go, you know, um, I'm always, you know, obviously more than happy to talk to you guys again. And and I have other folks here with lots of experience and education who would uh, probably be good resources for you to talk to too. Well, and we, yeah, even in this, uh, you know, we did about an hour and a half. Uh, we identified a few areas, you know, the, the, the clicker training aspect, um, there are limitations to that and it yep. might not necessarily work within the context of academy training. So it's, it's really important for academics and researchers to, to work with, with folks such as yourself. And, um, because you can really highlight those areas where we think we've got something really solid, but there are some substantial limitations to actually, uh, implementing it in practice. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Great to talk to you, man. Thanks, Sean. It was great talking to you, too. I think it'd be cool to have you back on at some point. Um, yeah. Maybe talk about some different topics or maybe rehash uh, some of the stuff that um, that we talked about today. Or That's uh, brilliant. I don't know, but we got to stay in more frequent contact, that's for sure. I agree. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Have a good one. You too, John. See ya. Bye. Maybe-
you think I'm somebody else?